Hello everyone, welcome to the second floor art department. My name is Nicholas. Let me go ahead and lock this lectern from moving. There we go. Now it's not rolling all over the place. Um, in case you were curious, the Strand was founded in 1927 over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 92 years, uh, we're still here. Still run by the same family that founded it, the Bass family, yes. And still housing new and used books. Already off to a great start. Uh, tonight, I am very excited to welcome Ariana Rains, author of four poetry collections, the Obie-winning play Telephone, and most recently, a sand book. She has created performances and art projects for the Whitney Museum, Works Plus Process at the Guggenheim, Stuart Shave slash Modern Art, and more, and has taught poetry at many institutions, including Columbia, Yale, NYU, and UC Berkeley, where she was the Holloway poet. Recently, a McDowell Fellow, a Dora Marr Fellow, and a poet in residence at the T.S. Eliot House, she performs frequently around the world. Join joining Ariana tonight for the reading are, in no particular order, C.A. Conrad, a 2019 Creative Capital Fellow and the author of nine books of poetry and essays. While standing in line for death, received the 2018 Lambda Award. A recipient of a Pew Fellowship in the Arts, they also received the Believer Magazine Book Award and the Gil Ott Book Award. Rob Bresney, who writes Free Will Astrology, a syndicated weekly column that appears in over 100 publications all over North America, as well as in translation in France and Italy. And lastly, Zoe Bresney, a poet and organizer from the Bay Area, based in New York. Her chapbook, Earthworks, was published by Land and Sea Press in 2019. Zoe plays a mix of spoken word, international pop, and YouTube black hole songs, which I'm not familiar with, but now I am. <laughs> curious, um, on her weekly radio show on WFMU 91.1 FM. I can't read that without doing the radio voice. Please join me in welcoming these inimitable poets to the Strand. First up, I believe we have Zoe, unless I have the order incorrect. Nope, we have Zoe. Big round of applause. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. I hope to set the right tone for the evening. Um, happy full moon. I have my Philip Lamantia book here for encouragement, um, an amazing San Francisco poet. Highly recommend. Starting with sign into my account. I am an Emblem Health member, user ID, Zoe Breeze, password towards a new era of healing. Roy de Monde, dragon fruit coconut lens in which to view the corporate goddess. Her flowing locks profess, distract the misery strawberry too devoted to my world. Chaos forever in the seams of thrifted designer jeans with laced up Victorian ribbons and gilded velvet pathways toward short term live dreams realized. Gush and brilliant terror and love in this new abandonment, suckable as plums in a hallway of an underground basement where Marquis de Sade and I were of one mind tasting pineapples, cameo brooches burst and showered us with pomegranate fumes. Machine girl deafening us out, bitten twice, two steps forward or back. It makes all the difference. You force me to awaken my hidden power. Gurus evolving through time, 
Spirit, animal, heart, swallowed, eroticism denuded on the banks of icy, immortal beings. Learn one new anxiety coping skill a day. This one is called hold ice in your hand. This one is called gurus evolving through time. An ecstatic hug, rose petals squeezed into your palm. This one is called annual water park pass bought on a stolen credit card. Flashes of dissociative joy amidst sunlit shafts of western isles. Energy moves at the lips, things that carry me through. A backyard blow-up pool viewed from the subway platform through the winter, convenience store packages bright and neat as heaven. Light beams for the sky of a transfer corridor after Cedar Saigo. Everyone is dying to vacation, how to live in wonder without thinking of someplace else. A forest bath dappled, dappled with light, a YouTube music channel called Extreme Private Eros. Another word for celestial or transcendent, stars in the universe, relaxing screensaver. You'll be famous for loving me, I'll be famous for loving you. The most feared song explained, bowing low before an iridescent yellow. Arriving home, she feels a short period of euphoria after running on the treadmill, then drinking a tall glass of cool, not cold water. This one is called Heart Megapolis. Surrounded by trends, I try to create magic on my computer, the checkered Alice in Wonderland playing board, the printed cherry, wearing it while sitting in institutions, Tuesday, 10 to 6 p.m., on the periphery of power, a view of empire, penthouse sculptures, and all this dirty water. One toe in, they'll let you dip. Feel the coolness and the smoothness for a moment. A child put a seashell to my ear. I'm, I'm disconnected from my life. The sea, they repeat over and over. Listen, you can hear the water. Craig is watching a live birth on YouTube during a techno set. Real fact. Dylan is telling me about Pangea theory, a collected longing and nostalgia for being geographically connected. To know the color of a person's aura is not a skill that's valued in the world. Burning Witch wrote the lyrics, born to die before Lana Del Rey. I've been accused of draping my darkness in beauty in order to swallow it better. I'm drinking coffee and beer simultaneously while listening to ambient music. I look at photos of the elegant aging goth on my feed, Eva O. Oh. She posts a video of feeding her two German shepherds dried apple chips. They look like giant fruit bats with lit up eyes. I'm always alone. My puppies can only look at me with their sweet eyes as I weep. I work with children because they don't judge me. Can you? Do you know how to make someone feel better? The greatest gift you can give someone is the purity of your attention. I look up for the first time in months. I forgot about the sky. I'm surprised every time. I look in for the first time in months. I forgot I'm alive. I'm surprised every time. And then this last one. All the windows rolled down. I watch the sunset in a stalled car. I listen to DJ Diana's Angel of Ad Admonition mix on my phone. I've got to find the God inside my other mind. 
Dylan says everything is all right, all right. Why wouldn't he? During doing the best I can in this moment. One of the goals of late capitalism is to leave you with no time to dream. What is the foundation for dreaming? I know how to say, hello, nice to meet you. I know how to eat a bacon, egg, and cheese in between jobs. I'm looking for something with the intensity of a teenager looking for porn, digitally meandering down a road, taking screenshots of nature and objects. How do you describe that which is invisible and unknowable? I hadn't remembered my dreams in weeks before bedbugs triggered a dream with insane colors. I stole a Gerhard Richter mirror piece that hung above an infinity pool. Now you can see me sleeping under it on Google Street View interiors. All my past and future lovers holding each other's hands on the cool pillow. Reincarnation is reading the flowers of evil for the second time and only now understanding the line, every color became a lustrous prism, liquid, liquid turned to glowing glass. Let me try to heal you with something deeper than the void. Thank you. And up, up next, Rob Resnick. The Uruguayan author Eduardo Galeano reminded us, the church says this body is a sin. Science says this body is a machine. Business says this body is a product. This body says I am a fiesta. <laughs> you taste delicious. Animals understand you. Your importance is unusual. The funny faces you make are interesting to look at. You fight for power in all the right ways. Ecstatic gratitude is streaming out of you. I see the best in you. Your divine attitude. You have strong feet and a pioneer heart. No one can overflow as well as you can. You are famous with God. You are famous with me. You are famous with the frogs and bears and roses and pines and oceans and earth and sky. A lost tribe salutes you from the other side of the veil. You remind me of a star. This is a perfect moment, as you know. It's a perfect moment for many reasons, but especially because you and I are waking up from our sleepwalking thumb-sucking, dumb-clucking collusion with the masters of destruction and delusion. Thanks to them from whom the painful blessings flow, we are waking up. Their wars and tortures, their crimes against nature, extinctions of species, their engineered diseases, their spying and lying in the name of the Father, sterilizing seeds, trade trademarking water, Molestations of God, celebrations of shame, mangling our dreams and defaming our names, their ruthless commercials, their blood-sucking hustles, their endless rehearsals for the end of the world. Thanks to them from whom the painful blessings flow, we are waking up. Their painful blessings are cracking open more and more gashes in the sour and shrunken mass hallucination that is mistakenly called reality. 
And through the fractures, ripe eternity is flooding in. News of our soul's true home is pouring in. Our allies from the other side of the veil are swarming in, inspiring us to become smarter and brighter and kinder and trickier and wilder. Thanks to them from whom the painful blessings flow, we are waking up. So tonight I'm here to ask you to vote for me. <laughs> I'm asking you to cast your ballot for me in my bid to become the sublime synergizer of the United Snakes of the Blooming Ha Ha. <laughs> Now, you may not know much about me and my policy, so I'll just tell you briefly. First of all, I am the most total nobody in a world full of nobodies. I am a sex laugher. I'm a friendly shocker. I'm a fantasy doctor. I'm a time traveler. I'm a jinx unraveler. I'm a curiosity savior. I champion the art of adoration. And I battled the genocide of the imagination. And here's the most important fact about me. The people I trust most are those who wrestle and negotiate with their own shadows. In other words, they make preemptive strikes on their personal share of the world's evil. They fight the good fight to keep from spewing their darkness on the people around them. And I aspire to be like those shadow wrestlers, which is why I kick my own ass and wash my own brain on a regular basis. <laughs> now, I'm here to tell you that I'm, I want your vote. And I'm here to tell you that if I am elected, you will learn how and why to kick your own ass and wash your own brain as well. <laughs> If I am elected, there will be a new Bill of Rights, and the First Amendment will be your daily wage is directly tied to the beauty and truth and love you provide. <laughs> and yes, the first new amendment will rhyme. <laughs> if I am elected, I will show you why it's so crucial for the future of daffodils and sea urchins and rhinoceroses and the coral reefs that well-paid women fill at least 65% of all jobs everywhere for the next 222 years. Yeah. <laughs> if I am elected, when news anchors report tragedies to their audiences, they will be mandated to break down and cry and let their emotions show. <laughs> no more poker faces when I am elected. Bravo, viva, whoopee. Ooh, eureka, hallelujah. Abracadabra. If I am elected, I will create a new cabinet level department, and I will call it the intimate indigenous incandescent intrigue of freaky teasers and creature teachers. <laughs> and I will fill all the jobs in my new department with wizards and shamans and witches who will cast inside out, upside down, death and resurrection spells against all the corporate criminals who have been torturing the Earth's beloved plants and animals. If I am elected, there'll be an 11th commandment, thou shalt not bore God and goddess. <laughs> If I am elected, the word asshole will be used as a term of endearment rather than abuse. <laughs> if I am elected, I will launch a crusade against a covert form of terrorism that I call the genocide of the imagination. You can probably guess what that is, although you may not have heard the term. The genocide of the imagination is the ruthless, high-tech, Invasion, colonization, paralyzation, and desecration of our sacred imaginations. Our primary magical power. Our main tool for creating the world we want and love. If I am elected, there'll be legal highs, not legal lows. <laughs> Mystical science and erudite horoscopes. Meditation will be taught in schools. There'll be eight billion different golden rules. Compassion will be an aphrodisiac. 
that you and I will grow up to be pyrokleptomaniacs with a compulsion to steal fire from all the fraudulent gods. If I am elected, we'll change our form of government to a magical realist democracy where millions can vote for ecstasy. April fools will come once a week. <laughs> Plutocracy will be a felony. There will be 77 genders <laughs> that can all fuck each other. <laughs> the moon will be your father. The sun will be your mother. If I am elected, if I am elected, I will halt the exports of all F-15 fighter planes, M-1 Abrams battle tanks, and Apache attack helicopters. I will halt all exports of those monstrosities to Saudi Arabia and Narnia and Iraq, and Hogwarts, and the United Arab Emirates, and Middle Earth, and every other realm that is in danger of being demonically possessed by the defense contractor Lockheed Martin and his gangster flunkies in the Pentagon. Yeah. <laughs> if I am elected, I will confiscate the ill-gotten tax-free loot that multinational narcissism dealers and the Fortune 500 robber barons have stashed in offshore banks, and I will use the liberated cash to finance generous reparations, exaltations, consecrations, and vacations for African Americans and Native Americans. If I am elected, I will buy up all the pizza huts in the world and convert them into a global network of menstrual huts, <laughs> moon lodges, where for a few days each month, every one of us, members of every gender, can resign from the crazy making nine to five. We'll drop out and slow down and break trance and dive down into eternal time. Well, we can sleep nine hours every night and practice our lucid dreams and wear wildflower crowns and underwear made of moss and mushrooms and river rocks. We'll think with our hearts and we'll feel with our heads. We'll study the difference between stupid, boring, useless pain and smart, fascinating, useful pain until we get it right. If I am elected, you will be elected too. <laughs> if I am elected, I will be the sublime synergizer of the United Snakes of the Blooming Ha Ha, and so will you. When we are elected, we will be the singing commanders of forbidden sacraments and taboo justice. We will be the transgressive storytellers in charge of renegade bliss and blasphemous reverence, when we are elected, we will be animistic activists, perpetrating voracious listening and wildcat healing. So please vote for me, and thanks for listening. <laughs> That was amazing. You were so good. Zoe and Rob. I'm going to just jump into it. So I uh, write through rituals. 
I'm not going to end all that. I'm just going to talk about the latest ritual that I want to talk about. Well, I'm going to read some new poems from a new ritual, but in my latest book, I, there's a ritual that opens this book that completely changed my life. I, um, I started doing these rituals. I started writing in 75, but I started doing these rituals in 2005. It's a long story why, but I don't want to get into that. But I knew that they could do more than just give me poems. And I'm, I'm why I exist is I had a boyfriend named Earth. We met at an ACT UP, we had met at ACT UP demonstrations back in the 1980s. And then he was uh, down in Tennessee recalibrating after many years of, I mean, we, we, some, 75% of everybody we knew died of AIDS back then. But so, and we don't know who did this because it was never investigated, but he was at this queer spiritual community called Short Mountain. And he was brutally, tortured, raped, and covered in gasoline and burned alive. And it was the beginning of a very long saga of pain and depression and dealing with the fucking police who covered it up. And uh, yeah, a bunch of problems. But I knew that I could do a ritual that could cure this, and I found it. Um, it's too long to talk about it, but it's in the book if you want to read it. I'm going to read just three of the, t there are three tiny, of the, they're, they're tiny little poems, there are 27 of them. I'm just going to read three of those. I'm going to read the first one. And they all have these, um, these glyphs. There are these shapes that speak on another level. A spider's web is made of digested fly brains, wings, hairs, legs, tears, pheromones, attracting more flies, dissolving us into the endeavor of love. Hold me to your song, it is delicious. Hear you one more time in the middle of night, tooth it open. Love all unloved parts without pause. Dear ghost flickering with flames that no longer hurt, deflated lungs expanding, you say they can only burn a faggot once. This piece begins with um, this incredible book called Another Mother Tongue, a quote from this book by Judy Gron, who's this great um, grandmother queer poet in San Francisco. And it's called Another Mother Tongue, like I said, and it's about, it's one of the few books that traces the history of queer people in ancient Europe before it was colonized by the church. When you died the way you died, it was contaminating, a new danger of being lost and insecure. But reality can never be avoided forever. At the same moment, who is afraid of whom? The killers or my beloved, or guilt of my continued song? Desire is not what we achieve, it's a knife of uncovering the wrong way or racking in the alchemy of a mood. I should never trade youth for poetry's resonance of aging. But I can put every poem I ever wrote in a pile and burn them if you would appear on the other side. I want to finish this set by just reading the one that, where the depression broke. And I just started to really fall in love with life again. And uh, it's, yeah, and it looks like this, if you can see it. It's like this, send, it's just sending me right up. The spirit of your flowers is my favorite shelter. We were in love is the main thing. Faint as green light and tree pulls me forward. Whenever life is beautiful makes me think of you. Carry color of the forest to be with you. To belong to this world with you. To have what we have, and that is it. Yes, the present is between the past and future, but it's too radical to be called the middle. So I'm doing a new ritual, thank you. Thank you. So poetry and ritual are two ancient technologies that have completely changed my life. And I wanna talk now about that ritual helped me lead into this new one. It's called Resurrect Extinct Vibration and I'm dealing with the fact that I'm 53 and the, we've, in my lifetime we've lost 60% of the world's wildlife. It's this long ritual, I can't, I don't wanna, I don't have time to explain all of it, but I'm using their, I'm thinking about eco-poetics as more than just the degraded soil, air and water, also this conversation of vibrational absence. That when a species leaves a planet, they take all of their sounds with them. Heartbeat, breath, footfall, 
gone. We're losing about 100 species a day of insects, birds, vertebrate animals all around the planet right now. Um, and I'm just going to read some of these poems. The thing is, these poems don't sound like they come from that ritual, but they usually don't. Now, this first one I want to read from the set, it has to do with my boyfriend. And you know, it's like I'm, you know, I'm over half a century old now, and it's just six months ago, for the first time in my life, one person said to me, who didn't know me, they said, do you have children? And I was like, wow, nobody's ever asked me that. But about a dozen people have asked since then. Like, it's just this thing. And the thing is, um, just before he was murdered, we were talking about adopting a girl. And I mean, we didn't because he was killed, but she would be 21 now. And I was thinking about that, like maybe this 21-year-old spirit is like asking people to ask me this. So the thing is, this poem's about that. I'm going to hold them up so you can see their shapes, um, because the shapes have everything to do with what I'm doing. But. Um, but then I took her out of the poem because it just felt weird having a per person. A, it's just a love poem to him. And now it's called No One Holding It Shut. He called me a morbid son of a bitch and it gave me pause. <laughs> Enjoying a love song written by a woman who died one day despite her intimate care for the world around her. May our levees hold, may our strength return. A meow avowing a roar. There has been no one since he died who can be there in my chest, lift into the morning, believe in love again. Someone told me not to write about love, which is a conversation we can have after I'm finished writing this love poem, <laughs> holding a fist of wheat in the wind, a day to be as small as possible, following thoughts to their smells or sit and listen for the archived awaken. My friend became a missionary to meet women, but I think he was hiding his God from me, that voice who speaks to the memory of his heart before its affliction. The night before moving, I woke, then decided to go back to sleep for one more dream in the apartment where I loved him when he was alive, actually and completely, real flesh with fingers pressing glow-in-the-dark stars and planets above the bed and turning to smile and join me on the pillow. This one is called 900 Chocolate Hearts a Minute at the Candy Factory. I come from factory workers, and um, that's a true, that's true. 900 Chocolate Hearts a Minute at the Candy Factory. And it looks like this. Estimate number of near misses after interrupting the angel prying your father's jaws apart. Fashioned on tip of a fork, car horn at door of the birth canal, living section of dawn cooking inside the poet. Today is the day we reject this vexing cell by date worry. No guarantee we will cohere in our broken patch of garden. When you look at me, you see mostly water who will one day hasten to join a cloud. A thing I know for certain is to cook companionship into food, to taste and become fellowship. Eat a leaf with a hole to share nourishment with a future butterfly. You believe in sharing, at least you used to. I know you want to shock me with reports of enjoying glory holes, and I can act shocked to amuse you. Yet I wonder if you ever look up to the wall, thinking it will be his eyes. So I have a new chat book coming out called Bathe the Door with Blood of the Centaur. And now the centaur I'm referring to is Nessus. If you know your mythology, you might remember that he is the one, that's the centaur that Hercules kills. But then since the centaurs are from, um, well, they're extraterrestrials, so they came from down from space, that's what they say, and the blood of the centaur kills gods, so Hercules was killed by the blood of the centaur. So I was like, I, you know, all these stories about gods and goddesses are like, all they did was like rape and enslave him, it was horrible, I was like, bathe my door with that shit, I'm going to keep them away. <laughs> I have free broadsides too. I know they have books. If anybody wants, broad, does anybody want broadsides? Yeah. Oh, well then I'll just start ha sending them back. I guess. Or just here's another kind or something. These are kind. Here's more of them. So bathe the door with blood of the centaur. 
It's coming up from Catulpa Press. When orders for evacuation come over loudspeakers, the forest is at the center of the predicament. Their position keeps changing in the back room, dolling up the F word with sequins. We know what is coming as the oldest malediction against gravity, keeping pressure on the wound, riding against the impressions the center brought us, a new kind of anvil dropped without the slightest apprehension. We later lapse into a season of latent beauty, leveling quiet towns in their sleep. Somewhere north of here, the beginning of the Mississippi is a bucket of water. We tilt our ears from blankets of sweat and cum, overhearing birds in their temples of the trees. So I want to read a very new one that's so new that it's not printed out. But um, it's finished. I think it's finished. I don't know. I mean, do we really finish them? We abandon them. They're abandoned. I'm like a mama going around having lots of babies and just be like, you know, bye, get, be well. This one is called Memories of Why I Stopped Being a Man. It's shaped like this. Can you see it? It's normal if your cock gets hard while you are shooting, my uncle told me on my first deer hunt. Pythagoras knew the music of Jupiter and Mercury long before NASA. But to begin again, no hero itching at the door. That never-ending search for weakness in neighbors, siblings, coworkers, rival football teams. After seeing the do open body of muscle and blood, we examine what to do next with our lives. Imagine how they gathered around the first cannon ever fired, sweaty, amazed, rock hard. Before he died, Kalishnikov confessed of suffering unbearable nightmares. Surrender your nouns to my verbs, he said, he said, he said, he said. My old man complains about raising money for a dying woman because she survived and is happy. If he asks for his money back, I hope she slaps the shit out of him. It's not nice to stand motionless at someone's grave until they climb in. But we are in the USA, where 45,000 people were victims of gun violence last year. If I want my nouns to die or soil themselves, it's none of your fucking business. Isn't that the way it goes around here? After a million years of dreaming, the solution is still the same. Hold me to your bruised song until it warms me right. Thank you. So this one looks like that. This is pretty new. Um, it's also ready. It's called On the Tenth Anniversary of the Disappearance of America's Anti-War Movement While the Wars Rage On. And that is a fact. And like 2009 was the last nationwide anti-war movement rally, and we are in seven fucking wars for Sarah Fox. If you don't know Sarah Fox, she's this amazing witch poet in Minneapolis. His fig leaf flutters on the electric fan to reveal the true gift of this god. A long stem rose with a sad story to hide. America's all about growing that hair back, keeping that cock stiff. Empire crumbling around world's most obstinate heart on. A stick with a fur coat limping through the forest. <laughs> This bus runs on clean natural gas. Lies from our government and lies of corporations seem to find common ground, not too much trouble. When you are one of nine tomatoes resting in a blender just above the on button, our planet had herds of triceratopses. Can only imagine their lost sounds. Were they like lions or loons? Our human sounds all day. In the hospital, my friend Adam asked me to describe the nine cigarettes smoked by Betty Davis in All About Eve. <laughs> Gaps in the hero of the moment. Each puff a meditation on betrayal. Held by the indestructible power of nine. Faithless treachery known by many. Salvador Dali publicly praising Franco's iron fist after Franco executed Dali's former lover, the great poet of the people, Federico Garcia Lorca. Fuck Dali. So, you know, there was this huge Salvador Dali exhibit in Philadelphia at the Museum of Art maybe 15 years ago, and I stood on the steps screaming Lorca's poems. And um, 
people come and be like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm reading, you know, I told them the story and they're like, who's Lorcan? I was like, I've, go back, go look at your fucking melting clock paintings and fuck off. I didn't want this to you. Now, seriously though, you need to think about Salvador Dali doing that because how would you feel right now if your favorite artists were praising Trump? Because if you think that Trump's any different than Franco, you're mistaken. For the feral splendor that remains, for Kazem Ali. Sometimes I strain to hear one natural sound. When gender blurs in a poem, my world sets a tooth in the gear. If God is in me, when will I ask for my needs to be met? Every god is qualified. It's not such a secret. When I was afraid of the road, I learned to drive. Map says name of your city and ocean, line drawn to it, towing behind the big party. History of life on earth might be interesting to a visitor one day. Chewing parsley and cilantro together is for me where forest meets meadow. In a future life, would we like to fall in love with the world as it is, with a no recollection of the beauty we destroy today? So this one is called uh, You Cannot Return a Stretched Mind. I was trying to write an essay earlier this winter of this year about all the, my friends and lovers who died of AIDS. And they, that didn't get written yet, but they wound up in this poem. You Cannot Return a Stretched Mind. Human life expectancy is rising. I ask which group they mean. No one knows the answer. My favorite lovers were men who knew they were dying. They taught me to race to my limits without hesitation. Sometimes it takes more death than I can endure to caress life. If you could have seen my face the moment I realized no help was coming, despite every dream of lovers around the globe uniting, grateful for our embrace to hold the sadness different, we are too fragile for the world we are making, pretending to be tough. A sudden fear of heights over the Atlantic. Our bodies remember all abyss survived. Old answers fail to accept our family as every neighbor. My aunt says the prison means good paying jobs for generations. I imagine prison guards not yet born having lunch inside their parents. I plead with her, she laughs the eternal. And this is my last poem. And I'm so excited to be here with Ariana and Rob and Zoe. And um, I'm reading this one because it's um, the anniversary of Stonewall. And I'm fucking sick and tired of the fact that I'm living in a country where 30 of the 50 states, it is still legal to fire and evict queers. I'm living in a country where they are using conversion therapy on kids. I met people when I was fighting the HB2 law in North Carolina a few years ago who were, you know, their church and their parents insisted that they take conversion therapy. You don't just, by the way, conversion therapy also means you become a Christian in some cases. You don't just, they don't care whether you come from Jewish people or anything. You know, it's like you're going to be a Christian and straight. You're going to stop sucking cock or whatever they think you're doing. But they're using electroshock. Three of these people, we are electrocuting queer kids in this country every day. This is out of fucking control. Glitter in my wounds. First and most important, dream our missing friends forward. Burn their reflections into empty chairs. We are less bound by time than the clockmaker fears. This morning, all I want is to follow where the stone angels point. Bird song lashing me to tears. Heterosexuals need to see our suffering, the violent deaths of our friends and lovers. So no glitter on a queer is not to dazzle, but to unsettle the foundation of this murderous culture. Defiant weeds smashing up through cement. You think Oscar Wilde was funny? Well, darling, I think he was busy distracting straight people so they would not kill him. If you knew how many times I've been told, you're not like my gay best friend who tells me jokes and makes me laugh. No, I sure as fuck am not. <laughs> I have no room in my life to audition for your pansy mascot. You people can't kill me and think you can kill me again. I met a tree in Amsterdam and stood barefoot beside it for 20 minutes, then left completely restored. Yet another poem not written by a poet.
Sometimes we need one muscle to relax so the others follow. My friend Mandy calls after a long shift at the strip club to say, while standing in line for death, I am fanning my hot pussy with your new book. Will you sign it next week, my fearless faggot sister? Thank you. This reading is incredible. Right? Oh my God. Like, hi. Like, they have the power to resurrect. That's why I invited these people. I'm terrified, of course, to read now. But I've also been restored to life. How's everybody doing? Cool. Oh my goodness. Friday the 13th. Yeah. Luckiest day of the year. Um, I'm, just, I'm procrastinating. Um, yeah, OK. Like two empty wallets, my boobs. <coughs> like two empty wallets, my boobs flank my heart in readiness for you, Lord. You. For you, Lord. You. For you. For you. For you. Who no longer enrapture us? I don't know. There was a lot of like God rage, so I thought. <laughs> well, everything Conrad says is true, though, right? You guys know that. This is a very sophisticated group of people. Okay, so I don't even know. I think. Um, there should be like 20 poems dedicated to Conrad in here, but there's, w there's one. I'm looking for it. Um, I'm grateful for one. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you know, I, I, you know, I do. I do owe you my life. I mean, it's not a joke that like man cannot live on bread alone. That's not a joke at all. And the whole bread, the whole wheat thing is very interesting, isn't it? I find the whole thing very interesting. One of the things that I was studying when I was working on this book was um, the Yazidi uh, people. And their, their holy books were written down relatively late because in order, like part of the way that they needed to get some protection in, um, Iraq was to, to make themselves look like a people of the book. That sort of there it's a it's a religion that is sort of sometimes called Kurdish, but that can be like a complicated misnomer. And so the things that I was able to read, you know, they're translated by you know suspect translators, and I don't know, but there's they have a peacock uh, angel um, who is sort of kind of the prime administrator of the hierarchies of heaven. Um, and I'm always interested in these sort of administrative structures because they're always, you know, I mean, whatever. Uh, management theory, that's what I'm really into. <laughs> and, 
and so um, there's a story about the peacock angel being fed wheat, and it actually gives him a, like a, like a puffed up wheat belly, and he gets gas, and then Satan comes and pokes him in the anus, and he farts. And I just thought that was interesting, because well, now I'd like now I'm just like I want to be like and this one time when I was on mushrooms like blah, blah, blah. but um, there's like a whole wheat thing. But I'm gonna like pretend to be Conrad and be like I don't have time to tell you. <laughs> there's no time. I could tell you later. Um, all right. So I'm gonna be sour and dour. You got all the. F you've had all your fun. <laughs> I really am just procrastinating. Like, I know what I'm going to read, but I'm shuffling pages because I'm emotional. A partial history. Long after I stopped participating, those images pursued me. I found myself turning from them, even in the small light before dawn, to meet the face of my own body, still taut and strong, almost too strong a house for so much shame. Not mine alone, but also yours and my brothers, lots of people's, I know it was irrational, for whom I saw myself responsible and to whom I wished to remain hospitable. We had all been pursuing our own disintegration for so long by then that by the time the other side began to raise a more coherent complaint against us, we devolved with such ease and swiftness it seemed to alarm even our enemies. By then, many of us had succumbed to quivering idiocy while others drew vitality from new careers as public scolds. Behind these middle, middle management professors were at pains to display their faultless views, lest they too find censure, infamy, unemployment, and death at the hands of an enraged public. Individuals in such pain and torment and such confusion, hardly anyone dared ask more of them than that they not shoot. And in fact, many of us willed them to shoot. And some of us were the shooters. And shoot we did. And got us square in the heart and in the face, which anyway, we had been preparing these long years for bullets and explosions and whatever else. A vast, unpaid army of self-destructors, false comrades, impotent brainiacs who wish to appear to be kind. Everything we did for our government and the corporations that served it, we did for free in exchange for the privilege of watching one another break down. Sometimes we were the ones doing the breaking. We would comfort one another afterward, congratulating each other on the fortitude it took to display such vulnerability. The demonstration of an infirmity followed by a self-justificatory recuperation of our own means and our own ends, in short, of ourselves and our respect for ourselves, this amounted to the dominant rhetoric of the age, which some called sharing which partook of modes of oratory and of polemic, of intimate journals and of statements issued from on high by public figures whom at one time or another we all mistook ourselves for. Anyway, it wasn't working. None of it was working. Not our ostentation and not the uses we put our suffering to, the guilt and schadenfreude-based attention we extracted from our friends and followers, and even the passing sensation of true sincerity, of actual truth quickly emulsified into the great and the terrible metastasizing whole, to the point it began to seem wisest to publish only within the confines of our own flesh. 
but our interiors had their biometrics too and were functions not only of stardust, the universe as we now were prone to addressing the Godhead, but also of every mean and median of the self-same vicious culture that drove us to retreat into the jail of our own bones and the cramped confines of our swollen veins and ducts in the first place. Our skin was the same wall they talked about on the news and our hearts were the bombs whose threat never withdrew. Images could drop from above like the pendulum in the pit and the pendulum or killer drones to shatter the face of our lover into contemporaneous pasts, futures, celebrities, and other lovers, all of whom our attention paid equally in confusion and longing and a fleeting sense like passing ghosts of a barely remarked upon catastrophe that was over both before and after it was too late. We were ancient creatures built for love and war. Everything said so, and we could not face how abstract it was all becoming because it was also all the opposite of abstract. It was our flesh, our mother's bloodied forehead on the floor of Penn Station, and wherever we hid our face, amid a crowd of stars, for example, as Yates once put it. And for stars, insert celebrities or astrology here, your choice. And even when we closed our eyes, all this was all we looked at every day, all day. It was all we could see. We were lost in a language of images. It was growing difficult to speak, yet talk was everywhere. Some of us still sought to dominate one another intellectually, others physically, still others psychically, or some of all of the above, everything seeming to congeal into bad versions of sports by other means, and sports by that time was the only metaphor left that could acceptably be applied to anything. The images gave us no rest, yet failed over and over, despite the immensity of their realism, to describe the world as we really knew it, and worse, as it knew us. Okay, here we go. I found the Conrad poem. Wasting away in this vanilla darkness. Keggle now before the monarchs flutter up under the lamps to smoke. The guard coming toward us looks like Félix Morisot le Roi. Hurry, the rest of them won't be beautiful like him. Metallic taste of old cherry coke. These are the mechanics keys, don't move them. It happened to be a moment I was feeling bad about myself. We were in the souvenir kiosk behind the throne room. The arrow in my compass began to quiver. Solemn kernels slicing key limes into keys into a terrine of wasteoid pukes lightly slapped with a platelet lasagna by the white hand of a handsome waiter in a battalion of balls on a billiard table loaded with eternally tween thoughts reconstellating the diamond sense of genocide's very worst ideas. It was like a portrait of happy people that you and I have certainly both seen. I was only trying to recover a sense of myself. I'm not trying to be forgiven for that. I'm just telling you. Strange brand steaming up from my genitals. Gems are the eyes of God, said Julian. And how did birds begin? Void if detached. I came upon the ruins of a bird in a beet field in Normandy. I gathered them up and carried them quietly into Lithuania. I went into Lithuania very, very quietly quietly and silently sleep stopped coming. Some of my family had escaped about a hundred years earlier. I might have been the first to return. I hid everything I could recollect and also what I could not behind my books and I hid it behind my clothing and hair. Snowden was somewhere in the Moscow airport the day at duty free a Russian woman mistook me for a star. I'm nobody famous, I told her. She did not want to believe. The forests looked like a big black boar. Capital had a different way of flowing. It seemed to me in a new, virulent strain of heterosexuality. A lot of striptease bars, Zara's and sex clubs, shining black caviar, lurid orange rose. The rainbow spread across the surface of whatever spilled. It shone on the mallard's neck and all over the crow. Ooh. 
so I, I like, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, I feel like I should explain a little bit what this book does. Should I? It's it's like because it's weird. It's like sand. Like sand isn't a subject. <laughs> I'm really I'm really attracted to non subjects. Um, Non-starters and non-subjects are my thing. Um, so two-thirds of the Earth's landmass is desertifying. And that, I think that's really interesting because um, like, basically, it's like even if we all became perfect people tonight and, and never consumed another fossil fuel ever again, um, it would st the process would still be happening. So it would still need to be attended to even if we were ultimate and amazing. And, um, and it's a process that's happened on the planet before. And um, I just am interested in that idea of that, like the aridity, the drying out, um, because there's also like the proverbial desert to which um, mystics and sages go to figure out what's really going on. And so somehow there were all of these sands happening, you know, Sandy Hook, Hurricane Sandy. Sandra Bland's murder. It just all, it's, it w it's like one of the things that's being done to us is that it seems cacophonous, like none of these things can possibly be unified. Like there's no way to speak of all of these things at once. It becomes like a bad smoothie, like a poop colored smoothie with no taste, you know what I mean? Like how could you speak of all of that at once? It's not possible. And, um, and, I knew that I was writing a sand book because I'll, re I'll read you the poem that, ex that sort of tells it, but it's because uh, titles always come first for me and then I know like what my life is. And, um, but then I couldn't, but I realized very quickly that I couldn't do it. And then, but then this peacock thing started happening and the peacock came to help me. And so that ruins of the bird that it mentioned in that poem that I just read to you, I, it had, I had done this weird performance in London with a, a tarantula called The Origin of the World. And I thought, I know, I know, maybe the origin of the world is like my fear of bugs. Like maybe, maybe like the universal fear of having come out of a pussy is, maybe I could connect that to that like weird feeling that like a bug gives me, like ah! Um, I don't know, I'm try trying to talk quickly here. Um, so I'd done that performance with the spider and then I was in this beet field and there was this, it was like the site of a peacock massacre. And so, and I had just discovered this incredible poem by David Rattray called Mr. Peacock, which like you should go immediately to YouTube after this reading. It's a great thing to do on the full moon. It just like get into this, uh, it's like a free legal high. <laughs> it's a real trance inducing magisterial poem. And so there was like this weird wing had like passed over me and I realized that the bird had come to help me and I followed the peacock and it got me through the end of the book, okay? Does that make any sense at all? Yeah. All right, you're all very psychic and advanced. <laughs> so, yeah. To the reader. I'm just gonna not banter anymore. Oh my God, hi. I haven't seen you in like a decade. More like eight years, hi, cool. A couple weeks after Hurricane Sandy, I found myself on my knees sobbing before an image of the black virgin of Chekhostova known in Haiti as Ezili Dantor. This image had been given to me by a gay priest I'd met a short while before one long pleasant night we spent talking and blowing meth during a special period in my life. 
My heart had recently cracked open. Fear had departed me. I felt my middling capacities and medium looks beginning to become penetrated by drops of what I had always wanted, but still, even today, cannot name. What I'm trying to tell you is I found myself crying sincere tears because I wanted someone and because I now suddenly, it was 2012, had a home. I seldom had had one, and those moments when I want someone badly enough to weep and to do anything under the sun to make that person mine remain, it must be admitted, rare. Can you take seriously one at once so arch and so strange, so frank and yet so withholding? I'll wager that you can. And slash but, I am trying to escape from the problem of being taken seriously, and I'm trying to run away from ugly pictures of me, and I'm in flight from the burden of my homeless mother, which flight is married to my desire not to overthink how much I, too, extract from this ground and from the ones who have loved me, whose love I have failed to reciprocate adequately, even though I told myself I was lonely and that I needed it, the affection and the fucking, even the briefest of thoughts, if I wasn't going to disappear entirely like some forgotten minor god, the thoughts that think the mind in which they revolve are produced by the landscape through which we move. I was pursued by pigeons and doves with rings around their necks. I was pursued by dead, then living, then immaterial birds. I was beset by a capacity to see life and death as a range of colors, and that the colors of death, purple and variegations of writhing humus and white and black, like the black and white that will fill the world if you press gently but insistently on your eyeballs, were simply deathly colors describing varieties of living, and that there was, in fact, no such thing as death. And when I dove down below it, taking the form of an insect, and when I lay supine like a bug relaxing in the sun to describe what I had seen, and how truth and falsehood were weirdly married to the spilled milk splattered across the heavens, and in the basis of our turning cells, I also saw how, though more loosely now than perhaps before, the net that would trap me inside my life still hung over me, over it, over us, over me, and my naked, formless life itself, as it had in the earlier years when I bled for weeks on end, when I never slept, when I allowed vicious things to be done to me, and when I, in fact, wished for them and invited them, I saw how I was held by the reflection in the screen of my computer when it was in the off position. And I saw what my phone saw of my face as rocks of sorrow and confusion were born in my cheeks to bloom and die there, leaving serrated proof that the invisible world was real. But why am I trying to talk to you right now in this of all media? Not because I've seen things no one can explain and for which no lineage credentialed me. Not because I wish to pass out of the world and manage to. Or because I wish to pass back into it and was clemently received. Not because I know anything, though I might know something or even because I'm burning with desire to make myself known to you at last in the secret place I have prepared for us. So I think we're like over time, so I'm just gonna do, oh, is that a thumbs up that we are indeed over time? Uh, yeah, 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 cool. So one more. Um, well, so I was sort of thinking I would read you the very back of the book. Has any, does anybody, I, I'm going to like spoil it, spoiler. Um, it looks like this, and um, I just have to explain it a little bit. Ordinarily, when I, when I have, presented this part of the book, um, I, I have it on a screen and I kind of let you read it because it's not something that I actually wrote. Um, it um, came into me on a sunbeam 
And I, if you want to know more about that, I guess, uh, I, feel, I feel like I want to tell you about it. You guys want to hear? OK. I'm just like nervous that they'll kick us out and they'll be mad. And OK, thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Um, so it's a New York story, actually. Um, and this is like not the kind of thing that usually happens to me in New York City. So like that was like a big part of what's exciting. And I think I'm glad that I'm glad that it's okay to tell you about it because it could happen to you. Um, or maybe it already has. We'll talk about it later. But um, I was in this like really strange period in, in my life. I was like working on a performance that was very physically demanding. Um, it was like it was called Mortal Kombat and inv involved a lot of actual violence. Some of you, I know, I see some of you were like at that performance. It was like a performance of real violence <laughs> between me and a, an amazing actor. And he and I have the same birthday, so I just thought. We'll pretend to be twins, and um, and I just I I you know it was pre me too, but I had you know some things I wanted to work out. Um, anyway, so so the rehearsals doing that I'm not used to that kind of um, I'm not used to martial arts and like I don't I don't really have training in that I was into dance and theater <laughs> as a, as a youth so like just. In rehearsal, we would be like punching and slapping and kicking each other, you know, and it was a really interesting thing to practice doing um, because at least for me, like as a like as a feminine cis female, like I was not socialized to sort of or trained to like deflect energy coming toward you. And that's basically what martial arts teach you to do. And that's very empowering, actually. Um, and so it was like there was this whole new way of thinking about the space around me and that ener the energy of that. It was like the negative space of just air or something had suddenly become like the positive space of everything, and I was like really <laughs> conscious of that. And then you know my my co performer Jim, who's an outer sweetheart. We were also like beating each other. I was just like really interesting to be. At practice, like practicing that kind of violence that I wanted so badly to deconstruct. Anyway, it would put me in this really weird state of mind afterward. Um, I, my blood would kind of be humming. And I was, but I also had this job where there was like a creep, where my boss was a creep. And that experience of like, I've had, like, I've had, I had had every kind of creepy creep. I thought, <laughs> leading up to that. But there was something about having the creep be at this prestigious job that just like really sent me for a loop. And so the creep had caused this geyser of all this old PTSD to fill me. And as a result, I grew a beard. Some of you have grown a beard. Um, yeah, I grew a beard in my torment, um, made of acne, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and anyway, I was like leaving rehearsal, and I was crossing, um, you know, where Allen Street meets Delancey. There's like a bench there. There's like a like it, there's like what used to be a bathroom and there's like a bench, and it was sort of an overcast, warmish day. I think it was early October, and um, I was crossing and I felt the sun come out from behind a cloud. Well, you've all felt this, right? And it was really nice, but then it got it kept getting nicer and nicer. The feeling, the warmth. So I sat down on the bench, and it kept getting nicer and nicer and nicer and nicer until I was basically in a state of rapture. And I, I just surrendered to it. And in the back of my mind, even in my total surrender, there was always like the me being like, me, 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 like, 
like being like, you look stupid, like you're sitting on this bench or like whatever. But um, so like she was there and it was fine. Um, but then the, the sun started filling my body with um, intelligence and it started talking. And I, at some point, realized that I had my notebook. And so I like got my notebook out, and I started writing the shit down. And then I realized I had my notebook upside down, so I was even writing right to left like a Hebrew person, like a Hebrew-speaking person. Or when I say like a Hebrew, I'm referring to the Hebrews of old. I'm not using a racial slur. Although as a Hebrew myself, I have every right. <laughs> so, um, and you know, racism's fun. It's really, I'm getting off track here. That's not what I'm, that's not my message. I'm getting off message. Um, I mean, against your own, whatever. You guys know. So I'm like writing this stuff down in my notebook upside down and I realize at like, at like the third or fourth thing I'd written down, I was like, I have a beard, like a prophet of old. And then I, like, then I fully like gave myself over to the situation because I realized that I was in a, like I was being held in utter perfection and there was no going back. And, um, some of the things that were said, I should say that it wasn't literally audible. It wasn't like I heard a voice. It was in me, and it was used, it's, it's hard to explain this. Intelligence had to use everything that I had, so that included my memories and my stupidities and my fleshes and my cells. It just like used whatever was there this like whatever sort of frangible material to sort of recombine it and reconstitute it into the into the structures of what it was needing to say Does that you're all like yeah we've we know <laughs> um that's how it goes for us too uh and so but like i said that like the like idiot me was still there and and some of the things that it said i understood totally and completely in the moment, like in, in every direction I understood them, if that makes sense, across time and space. And some of the things that it said made me a little bit embarrassed. I agreed with them, but they, they, I thought, what will the people think? They'll think that I had the chutzpah to say this or whatever. Anyway, that's enough. So I'm just gonna read you what it said, okay? Any, any questions before I begin? When it's over, the reading will be over. Wait, what happens after that? Are there books to sign? Do we still get to talk? Oh, there's a Q&A? No, there's no Q&A, people. No Q&A. You'll have to talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. All right, here we go. Reality is perceptible. Situations are cells. People don't know how to use their talents. Analogy is the structuring principle of the universe. The suffering of woman is the true story of the universe. We have to understand ourselves at all costs. Nature extends from us. Nature mirrors us. Water, mirror, window. Each people has the gift of its catastrophe. Learn how to use this gift or meet your peril. Earth is special. People from all over the universe will come here. There is no back to get to. God didn't die. He's just not the only God in the universe. 
The moon is superior to the sun insofar as she has had the night to know he is not the only God in the universe. <laughs> Difference is meant to be comedy. Difference is a toy. Nazism was an invitation to the world to reckon with the nature of evil. Each thing teaches. When faced with evil, learn its secret. What urgent disease, deficiency within my own soul does this wretched symptom signify? We do need every kind of story because there is every kind of person. Yet still, great art is crucial for the world to watch when it watches divinity in splendor rather than what we're watching now while learning to watch. The world always sustains the maximum suffering it can bear according to the nature of its age. There will always be the maximum possible destruction in a given time. This is why the other world has always needed to be created knowing that the world has always sustained and will always sustain the maximum of destruction possible is why the other world has always and will always need to be created. Everyone has a star. This is why we practice dialogue. We're learning. Our solar system is analogous to the universe. The deeper into the cell we get, the more kinds of people we produce. The more we learn about the cell, the more we have to know about the people. Mercury also teaches, I want to be like, and the risks that go with I want to be like, to teach us about the principle of likeness that governs the universe. It's true that the older a thing is, the better it is, except with food and food-like principles. Not the sock on your foot, but any speck of matter in relation to the dignity of age that is the winery. Mercury favors women and children because we know what it's like to long to be everything, to learn by imitation, to listen. I gave you no man for a father. No man could stand between me and you. Medicine is divine, not as it is shown, but as it should be. Divine science, divine scientist, medicine would be divine. The reason great art matters is see as I see. Whatever you have been watching should have taught you by now. The time of spectacle will pass. Technology is for communication. Technology evolved solely for the purpose of divine communication. All its other forms are byproducts. There is nothing a person cannot love. Everything has a nature. Find out yours. Thank you.